So for the last four or five months, I've been working on my next long-term review. And as I announced in the video proclaiming where I was going, I've been looking at Bluefin. Now, one of the reasons why I chose Bluefin was because it's one of those distros that proclaims to be the future of Linux. Now, this is a term that has been well used over the course of, you know, like ever. And obviously, most distros... They're just distros, they don't do anything revolutionary, and they're not really or actually the future of Linux. They're just distros, right? So I took that with a grain of salt, but I knew that there were some things about Bluefin that were different, and that during my long-term review of the distro, I would have to fight along and learn about those differences and see how they actually changed the way I used it. So that's what I've been working on for the last five months. And I have to say, just kind of a overarching conclusion before we jump into the nitty gritty details, Bluefin is fantastic. It's really, really good. So if you don't want to watch any of those details, you can stop watching now and just move on to the next video. But if you want to know what's what, and you want to know what I actually think of Bluefin more than just it's really good, carry on. Before we jump in, Leave a thumbs up on this video, I'd really appreciate it. This stuff took a lot of work, so a thumbs up would be really nice. So let's go ahead and jump, jump in. So Bluefin is a release of the Universal Blue project, and that project is a project that is meant to take Fedora Atomic releases, formerly known as Silver Blue and Kino White and things like that, and uh, fill them out so that they're so that normal everyday users can use them without any setup or maintenance. That's basically what they're doing. They're taking bare bones, silver blue, or Kino white, which they're now called atomic distros, and they add things onto them. Codecs, things like that, drivers, enable repositories, all that kind of stuff. And just make sure that when you install them, you're ready to go right off the bat. You don't have to do anything extra, which is what you'd normally have to do with Fedora if you wanted to use it. So that's basically what Bluefin is. Uh, Bluefin specifically is the GNOME spin on this idea. There are also versions for KDE, and there's one dedicated for a Steam-like or a Steam Deck-like gaming experience called Bazite. So like I said before, when I first started this review, my idea was to really truly find out what's making this different because it is proclaimed as different. It's proclaimed as a new way of doing Linux. And that's always been very curious to me because I wanted to know precisely how they're going about it, what's actually changing it. And obviously there's been a whole bunch of, you know, worry in the, the Linux community about these changes. Like if this, this is really where the Linux community is going, is that a good or bad thing? So I was very curious about the changes and the differences that I was going to see while using the distro. There was a lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that was spread about how these types of distros were anti-Linux, anti-choice, anti-FOSS, and so on. The idea that there were certain files on your system that were read-only scared a lot of Linux graybeards away from the idea entirely. Now that I've been using Bluefin for several months, I can tell you that there is actually very little difference between this and your regular everyday traditional Linux distro. They're basically the same with some stuff and spice and magic sprinkled on top. All the Linux nerd stuff that you expect to be in a Linux distro are there. Like, 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 like the user directory, the Etsy directory, all the root directory, all that stuff exactly where you expect it to be. And the vast majority of those things are perfectly writable and changeable and deletable. If you want to delete your Etsy file, you can do that. Like, it, you can do it. Like, it's not it's not something that you can't do. You shouldn't do it, but you, you can. There are a couple of directories that are not writable. Specifically, we're looking at something like the user directory. And just like every distro, there are XDG alternatives to that, like lo .local slash share, which is something that you probably should be using anyways. The slash user directory is about the only directory that I think I would even remotely care about being read-only. And like I said, there are XDG alternatives to everything in there that you can use instead. So it's not that big of a deal. So the question is, if this is a normal Linux distro or it seems to be what's actually special about it, what m makes it the future of Linux. And the answer is pretty simple. It's containers. Now, 
Pause me if you've heard this before, but containers are the future of Linux. Everything that you know and love about Linux is going to be eventually containerized. That's just the way that things have gone. You know, Snaps and Flatpaks and Distrobox and uh, Docker and Podman and Kubernetes and all sorts of stuff. You hear the buzzwords all over the place and Bluefin is right at the center of that. There's two ways that this actually works. The first one is the most user-facing one, the one that I'll be focusing most on, and that is package management. Now, that's a pretty dry subject and we've talked about the number of different package managers out there, package formats and stuff like that. Bluefin aims to get rid of all of that traditional stuff and replace it with containerized technology. Things like Distrobox, Flatpak, and other technologies are what you're expected to use instead of those traditional package formats. Things like DNF and RPM and all that stuff. None of those things are anything that you'll ever use on Bluefin, or at least chances are you'll never use them. There are some ways you could use those like in Distrobox, but outside of that, in regular everyday usage, you're going to use Flatpak, you're going to use, and you're going to use Docker and Podman and Distrobox and stuff like that in order to manage and actually acquire your packages. That's the way that it's meant to work. The other part of this equation is one that most users won't ever see, and that's how the developers of this distro put the actual packages together. It's all done with cloud native technology and GitOps, basically CI CD, right? They then use that tech to create images that are then installed by you, the user. These images are special in that the image that I download and use is that is the exact same as the image that you download and use. So if you download the traditional Bluefin image and I download the traditional Bluefin image and keep those things updated at the same time, our images are going to be exactly the same. That means that any problems that occur aren't fixed on a user basis. They're fixed at, on the before the image is built by the developer. So if I reported a bug, they're going to fix the image. That fix will then filter down into everyone else's image because they're all meant to be identical across the board. I'm mostly going to ignore that part of the idea. All the GitOps and cloud native technology, all that stuff is completely irrelevant to how you use the distro. If you want to create your own image, and maybe you will if you want to use something other than GNOME or KDE, then you'll have to learn more about the cloud native technology like Bootsy, and you'll have to learn more about CICD and GitOps and all that sort of stuff. But the vast majority of people never going to see any of that stuff. They're just going to either choose Bluefin, which is GNOME, or they're going to choose Aurora, which is KDE, and they're going to be happy on their way, right? That's what the vast majority of people, including myself, would actually do if I were to use this distro. Any packages that they want afterwards would just be installed afterwards. They wouldn't have to build an image in order to actually get those packages. They'll just use Flatpak or Distrobox in order to get the packages that they need. They won't worry about building a, a layer or an image on their own. The vast majority of people, again, will just download the stuff afterwards. So let's go ahead and, and talk about some of the goals of Bluefin as a distro. The first one is to make Linux so that it a regular user can just do their work without having to worry about any of the traditional Linux nonsense. Things like updating and maintaining the distro, none of that stuff is anything that you should focus on when you use this type of distro. It's all done for you, and we'll talk more about that automation as we go along. Uh, the next one is they want to make it easier for developers to maintain an evenly updated base across all computers with cloud native technology and GitOps. Again, not something that we'll actively talk about in this review, but it's definitely something that the, the developers of this are very high on because it allows them to maintain a Linux distro in a way that's really never been done before. And the third one, and this is kind of a rehash of the first one really, but the idea is to take the make the OS completely invisible. You use your apps and you do your work and your tasks and you play your games or whatever, and due to the way the OS is built, you never have to worry about doing anything like traditional update maintenance tests, like updating your applications, getting a new kernel, any of that stuff. All of it is automated in the background. So those are the three true main goals of something like Bluefin and the Universal Blue project kind of in general. So let's go ahead then and talk about my initial impressions. Back when I first started this about four months ago, I will have to say that I was pretty 
surprised by the amount of stuff that was installed. Now, most of that's my fault because I did choose the DX version of Bluefin, and that comes with a ton of development stuff that just is kind of prepackaged along with the image. And I'm not a developer, so the vast majority of that stuff just went to waste. I didn't need it. I will say this, if you are not a developer, choose the regular version of Bluefin. You don't need the DX stuff. It'll save you approximately two gigabytes on the ISO, maybe even more. So definitely keep that in mind. And also, I just want to point out that that, that was a me problem. I chose the D DX version so I'd get everything and kind of judge everything. The developers on their website are very upfront about what the, what the images are. The DX is very blatantly labeled as for people who develop software. So uh, that was more of a my mistake. Uh, upon using it for a few days, my biggest takeaway was that it was kind of boring. Uh, it's a GNOME distro. They've done a lot of tweaking to GNOME. I'll talk about that later. Uh, it's just Fedora with a bunch of stuff installed for you. Remember that I'm a Linux nerd and I'm very proud to be a Linux nerd. Uh, so I expect part of the experience of switching to a diff uh, different distro to be setting up all the stuff and tweak making the tweaks and making sure everything's working the way that I want it to work. That's what a Linux nerd does. And I can hear the people who are not Linux nerds saying, well, Matt, that means that Linux is a hobby for you. And that's somewhat true. But I also do get work done on Linux. I just kind of combine those two, right? So I, my first experience was, or my first impression was that it was a very boring GNOME-based, Fedora-based distro. And, you know, such as it is. All the stuff that I'd normally do to s switch to a different distro is not something that really needs to be done with Bluefin. I set up my traditional GNOME key bindings and settings, but even things like the minimize button, which I normally have to add in with GNOME tweaks, was already done for me. And again, that just added to the sense that this was a boring distro. But the thing is, that's the point of Bluefin. It's supposed to be a boring distro. It's supposed to be an invisible distro. You're not supposed to think of the operating system at all. The goal, the goal here, and something that I needed to constantly remind myself of, was that this was a it was meant to be plug and play. It was meant to be something that you could just install and start using right out of the box without having to tweak anything. It was meant for the person who wants to use Linux without it being a hobby. I did end up rebasing my laptop to Aurora for a few days, which is the KDE version of the uBlue slash Bluefin experience or whatever. And I will say that it is a little bit different. On GNOME, everything is set up for you. There's not a lot of tweaking that you're supposed to do or that you can do, really. I mean, yes, GNOME Tweaks is installed and you could theoretically change the icon theme or whatever, and I believe that I did. Uh, you can change the wallpaper. You can change the buttons around with GNOME Tweaks. But other than that, there's not much really there for you to do, and that's by design. You're just supposed to hop right in and start doing your work or your tasks or your games or whatever it is you're, you're wanting to do. On the KDE version, because in traditional KDE fashion, there's a whole bunch more in terms of bells and whistles. It felt like there was more that you can do, that you're supposed to do. And in traditional KDE fashion, I spent a lot of time doing those things. And I, I, I felt that that really did take away from the entire experience. Like, you are supposed to get into this thing and just do your work, right? And KDE, as much as I love it, has a lot of bells and whistles and buttons and shiny stuff that a Linux nerd is going to be attracted to. And that was my case. I went in there and I, you know, I installed a new theme. I installed some new icons. I moved things around and got things right where they were. Because GNOME is so anti-customization, I just use basically GNOME as it was set up for me. And those experiences made it feel like the GNOME version met the goals of Bluefin a lot more than the KDE version did. So if I had to make a choice, I would really say that if you want to get the most out of Blue, uBlue and Bluefin and all these projects, the best one to use, and this hurts me to say, is the GNOME version, simply because it does feel like it, it meets the goals of the distro much more than KDE does. So let's then go into the special sauce. What actually makes these things different? Now, obviously, like I said, the GitOps and the cloud-native technology, that stuff makes 
the development of the distro different. But in terms of everyday usage, there is actually a special sauce that goes on here. And it's all about automation. And it's possible to do that automation because of the containerized nature of the packages that you're using. So in those initial days, you really don't get to realize what's going on with this distro that makes it any better than just a really well set up Fedora install. It's not until you've used it for a while that you come to realize that you've been using it for a few weeks and not once worried about an update. In my five or so months of using Bluefin, I never once manually updated, not a single time. In that time, I got several new kernels. I got a new version of GNOME. Uh, I also, every app that I installed was automatically updated without any interaction on my part. It just worked. I never had to worry about updates a single time. Now, I will admit that this is not 100% great. Uh, the downside is that the system updates do require restarts for things like the kernel and stuff like that. And you don't actually see any of that new stuff until you've done the reboot. And if you're like me, your reboots are few and far between. I tend to leave my computer up all the time and I don't always remember to reboot. Now, if you're a normal person, you're going to be all set on this distro because you're probably rebooting your system every single day. You're going to turn it off at the end of the day, you'll turn it on in the morning or whenever, and your updates will just be done. Me, I went sometimes weeks without those updates actually being applied or, you know, a, f a few days, like a couple weeks, whatever. Like there was always a, a wide range of time before I decided I was going to update my computer. And I kind of had to remind myself that I had to do it in order for, for those updates to take effect. Now, to be fair, that's not different than any other Linux distro. If I, on OpenSUSE, if I run sudo zipper dup and I get a new kernel or whatever, or I get new package libraries that require me to do a reboot, I still have to do a reboot. The process is exactly the same. The difference is that it's not automated. So when I do sudo zipper dup, that's something that I do. And I know once I've done that, I got to reboot my computer. On Bluefin, I don't ever have to do an update. So I don't remember to do the second part of the process, which is rebooting the computer. So that's more of a, of a my way of working problem, but it's still something that I encountered. So maybe a little bit of a, of a drop down for a notification or something that reminds you that you have to reboot your computer would be nice. It's also possible that that exists and I completely effing ignored it. Uh, I don't pay much attention to notifications, so it probably wouldn't have done me any good anyways, but still something to keep in mind. But outside of all that, not having to really manage the distro was amazing, like seriously cool. And it was a revelation, really. Uh, on OpenSUSE, my current distro of choice, I have to sit and wait for zipper dup and I have to do that every four days. And while I've gotten used to zipper slowness and I usually just go and do something else while I wait, it's still something that consciously takes up some of my time. Nothing like that in Bluefin, it's all automated and that was just an awesome experience. I didn't realize how much I hated doing system updates until I realized I didn't have to do them anymore. That was really cool. So let's go ahead and turn our attention to package availability. Bluefin aims to be different in this regard more than any other. No longer will you go to your terminal and run a command with DNF to get your packages. The, packet, the traditional package format, if the Bluefin developers had their way, would be completely dead. And we can all agree that the traditional package formatting system is a mess because everyone does it their own way. We have Pac-Man and, and package builds on Arch. We have DNF and RPM on uh, Fedora. And we have RPM and, and uh, Zipper on OpenSUSE and Apt and uh, Deb packages on Ubuntu. And we have Snaps and Flatpaks and all this stuff. It, it, all, everyone's doing their own thing and it's n no, no cohesion whatsoever. And that causes problems for both developers and users. On Bluefin, you will get your packages in one of three ways. You'll get it through the preferred way, which is Flatpak. The second way you'd be getting it is through Homebrew, which is a terminal application which allows you to install terminal-based and non-GUI applications. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. And finally, the other way you'd be getting your stuff is through DistroBox containers, which is a front end for Docker and Podman, and allows you to basically install other distros and then install packages from those distros onto your Bluefin machine. 
This gives you a wide selection of basically anything you can think of. There's no package that exists on Linux that you can't, at least potentially, through some work, get that package on your Bluefin machine. That's awesome, right? You can, I mean, it's not different than any other distro because you can use Flatpak, you can use Homebrew, you can use DistroBox on any distro. That's for true. But the differences here is that those are the official ways here. There's not actually another real way of getting any dis packages on your machine. DNF doesn't exist on your Bluefin machine. Now, there is something called local layering, which allows you to use a command called RPM OS tree that you could then install a package from the Fedora the, the repositories onto your machine. You then reboot your machine, and that would then allow that package to be part of the image that you're using. That's not a recommended way of doing things, and you're not going to want to do that if you want to maintain image parity to everything else. And it also is going to be is something that's going to be going away next year. They're going to be turning that option off. Now, you can still get to it, but you'd have to consciously do that. So it's not something that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to use Flatpak, you're supposed to use Homebrew, and you're supposed to use Distribox. Those are the three ways you're supposed to do it. And if you want to get the most out of Bluefin and use it the way that it's supposed to be used, those are what you're supposed to be using. And I think that that's perfectly fine. In practice, everything feels a little messy just because there are so many different ways of getting your, your packages and it, there's no cohesion there. But again, I had to remind myself that, the, that I'm a Linux nerd and most people aren't going to be opening up the terminal to do any of this stuff. They're going to be using the GUI software center for flat packs. They're going to be using Box Buddy for DistroBox and things like that. So when I thought about this being a messy solution to all the package management stuff, it's really not for normal people because normal people aren't ever going to make it past the GNOME software center, which is flat pack only. If they can't find what they want there, they're going to assume that it's not available or they're going to get it from, you know, maybe they'll discover DistroBox or whatever and use BoxBuddy to get there. Only those who were at least a little in the way of nerd tendencies will ever explore further. So if you are a normie, and we're going to talk more about normies as we go along in this review, chances are you're just going to focus on the software center, which is enabled through FlatHub. You have access to everything that FlatHub has access to, and that's pretty good these days. So let's talk a little bit about homebrew because this is something that the devs in the Bluefin documentation give a lot of time talking about. In my time with Bluefin, this is mostly left unused. This feels like more like a nerd thing since all of the applications that are available via brew are focused on the terminal or non-GUI applications like Fe or Yazi or Foot, things like that. Specifically things that are run or are in fact terminals and those are nerd things. And while that is useful in certain situations and is a pleasant workaround for the lack of a traditional package manager, it's not something that you'll probably use all that much, probably. So all that stuff being said, FlatHub has gotten really, really good, and I had no issues getting all the software that I needed. I only used Brew twice. That was for Yazi and Foot. I wanted to try the Foot terminal. I did that. I use Yazi all the time. I'm, I'm glad that Yazi is available because otherwise there'd be no way of really getting that other than building it from source, which I didn't, you know, particularly want to do. Now, we could also talk a little bit about DistroBox. And as much as I'm a fan of it, I didn't really find a use for it this time. Uh, I did at one point use it to install DaVinci Resolve, but I ended up installing that natively. Uh, I will say that they include BoxBuddy, which is a really good thing. I've made a video about it. Uh, basically, what that allows you to do is seamlessly install DistroBox images and manage them and start them and all this stuff without ever having to seriously do any of that work in the terminal which is a great uh, a great thing uh, the idea behind these types of distros is that you install your packages in a containerized format one that doesn't really ever execute outside of the user space but as I said earlier, there isn't really anything stopping you from installing things in a more traditional source-based way. I managed to install Resolve natively just fine because it stores all of its binaries and libraries in a file that the, is user-writable. Uh, there was no issue there, and even if there had been, moving those files to a writable alternative would have been very easy. Things 
are a lot of their, there are a lot of XDG alternatives to the non-writable parts of the system, so I would have just had to move them around. I didn't have to, but I could have if I needed to. You can also install things using pip or pipx or npm or anything like that, just like you would on any other distro, because all of those things just execute inside of user space, and all of that is free reign to you. So the next part of this that we need to talk about are the installed applications. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I did install the N the DX version and there's a lot of stuff here that I didn't really need to cover. I, I only really have a few things to say about it. First, the default terminal that is included is not great. And I know I'm going to get a lot of flack from George Castor about that because he loves it. But I didn't like it. I, I know that it works great with containers and if you are big on DistroBox, you'll probably really want to use it because it's very, very good at allowing you to basically create different environments for DistroBox and colorize them and just, it's a great experience with, with containers. But when you're not dealing with containers, I found it to be kind of clunky. It doesn't support image previews out of the box and it was just kind of slow. Now, that's because it's based, as far as I know, or at least it takes a lot of inspiration from GNOME terminals, and none of them support image previews out of the box. So, whatever. Uh, you notice I didn't say the name of the terminal, and that's because I can't pronounce it, uh, and I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to try. It's, it's, it's a really, really bad name. They should rename it. If, if they want people to be able to say it, they should rename it. I will also say that if you're not a developer, you should probably avoid the DX version, like I said earlier. It has a lot of dev tools in it, and you probably don't need any of those things. So just get the regular Bluefin version. Bluefin also includes some regular GNOME and Fedora tools that you might find useful. Things like a GUI that allows you to view your system logs, warehouse and flat seal to manage your flat packs, and pick a backup for backing up via Borg. All those things are included, which is pretty nice. It makes a pretty cohesive experience. You also get tools like Input Remapper and Solar, which will help you manage your devices. Those may be DX only options, I'm not actually sure. The necessities that come with Bluefin make Fedora a dream to use. Things like your codecs are pre-installed and if you use NVIDIA again and you use that particular image, you're going to get the, the NVIDIA drivers installed out of the box, which is a phenomenal win if you are a Fedora user because if you've ever tried to install NVIDIA drivers on Fedora, you've probably also experienced depression and pain like no other. It is not an easy thing to do, and trying to figure out which version of, of the drivers that you need, where to get them, enabling the proper repositories, it's a mess. Honestly, it's the thing that I hate most about OpenSUSE because also getting the drivers on OpenSUSE is, also, is just as much of a mess. So the fact that there's an opportunity for you to avoid all of that is very, very good. Another thing that Bluefin sets up for you is the GNOME experience. With about a dozen different GNOME extensions pre-installed, the experience is much less vanilla-y than regular old Fedora. Nothing here that is drastically going to change the user experience, but instead are extensions that you probably are going to install anyways. Uh, things like Dash to Dock, GS Connect, user themes, and so on, they're all pre-installed for you. There are a few frivolous ones too, too that are also installed, uh, like background logo, logo menu, and blur my shell. Those things are just there to make it look a little bit different, which is fine. I have no, no problem with it, but they're also installed. Uh, the DX version at least also comes with tail scale, not something that I've ever used or really have a need to use, at least at the moment. So that may or may not be something that you ever need to use, but pro probably you'll just disable that like I did. The next thing I want to talk about is something called UJust, and I think that this is pretty cool, but it's cool in a nerdy way. So they've included a tool called Jujust and it's a cloud tool that basically aliases preset system actions. Its purpose is to help manage your installation. It allows you to do things like change between the stream that you're following. Uh, just as a side note, the stream is basically, how would I go about explaining that? I think that the best way would be to, it, it's like the different branch that you're on. So if you're if you're on the default branch, you're going to be a whole version of Fedora behind. Whereas if you're on a the less stable branches, you'll get a more recent version of Fedora, a more recent version of GNOME. And you can use UJust to change between those branches with just a couple key presses on your keyboard, you'll be able to change which branch you're actually on. They call them streams, right? 
You just also allows you to do things like easily rebase your, your image to an earlier version of the install in case something goes wrong. You can configure your grub here. You can boot into your BIOS using UJust, which is kind of cool. You can toggle automatic updating using this tool. Although why you'd want to turn off automatic updating and still use uBlue seems kind of silly seeing so that's like one of its premier features. It does a ton more as well. If you're in a terminal pro, you won't have any issues discovering what you just does. Uh, there's a splash screen that comes up on terminal first launch that tells you some of what it can do and how to discover more. If you're not a terminal bro, you'll probably never see it because you're never going to open up the terminal, which I think is fine. You notice the tone there is questioning since I do find those features of you just very useful, but they're all nerdy tools and hiding them where only nerds dare tread is probably a good idea, but it does shut out what I think is a really cool tool for a lot of people to use. And most of those people are going to be normies and they're just never going to know it exists. Okay, let's go ahead then and move on to some of the problems that I discovered or that I experienced during my time using uBlue. The first one is that it is mostly a me problem probably. Uh, Bluefin hated my KVM switch, like absolutely despised its guts. And I, I had problems where sometimes it wouldn't wake up from sleep after I switched to it through the KVM switch. I had problems where it was very laggy and slow after going into it from the KV switch between switching from OpenSUSE back to Bluefin. And I also had problems where that stutter would cause the entire GNOME experience to crash. And this happened on both Xorg and on Wayland. So it wasn't a Wayland problem like I originally thought it was. Uh, it happened on both. Uh, I didn't have the problem on my laptop, so it's definitely going to be related to using a KVM switch. So again, that's a me problem for sure, but it's something that I did notice. So if you too use a KVM switch, you may have a problem now. It's also quite possible that it's because I have a cheap ass KVM switch and it just doesn't like GNOME for some reason. Maybe I wouldn't have the problem on KDE. I didn't have the problem on OpenSUSE at all. So th there's that one. Uh, the next one is Bluefin relies heavily and primarily on flat packs, but flat packs still have a few issues that make them not great to be relied on. Uh, for one thing, and probably the biggest thing, is the theming of GTK. GTK3 applications is still sus. It's not great. Uh, Genie, for example, is blindingly white, like whiter than I am. And uh, that's not great when the rest of the system is, is using dark mode. So that's not great. Uh, GTK4 apps do just fine. Uh, I, I will say that this isn't a bluefin problem or one that I really expect them to fix. But due to Flatpak being the primary means of application acquisition, you're probably going to find yourself noticing the theming being inconsistent on many older GTK applications. Uh, QT applications are also just kind of downright broken in some ways in terms of theming. Uh, but that's, not, again, not a Bluefin thing. That's a GNOME thing. So there you go. Another thing that I didn't really care for, as I mentioned before, was the default terminal. I found it very clunky and overburdened with features that I just didn't need. Uh, that being said, if you love to use Distrobox in the terminal, this terminal that shall not be named because Matt can't pronounce it, uh, is a very good option. Uh, I just didn't care for it. I'd also say that I'm used to Kitty, which is more minimal and completely configured in config, uh, config files. So... Mostly, I think that that dislike of the terminal is on me. So it's probably perfectly fine, just not for me. So let's go ahead then and move on to my conclusions, which I think are mostly positive, but I'll let you guys be the judge of that after I'm done with this section. So uh, Bluefin has a major problem, and it's it's a major one, really. It, their, their problem is that their goal is legit and admirable, and even their execution is great. Like... A lot of times distros will set themselves some goals and then they'll not be able to execute on those goals. They'll do it half-assed or, you know, they'll be so ambitious with their goals that they just can't possibly meet them. You blew. Not the case. It set some goals. It, it reached them. It created a very good distro that did the things that it was supposed to do. But their marketing is sus, as the Gen Zers would say. Uh, if you talk to the developers they'll tell you about cloud native technologies and git ops and how they build it and they'll nerd out about all those things for hours on end and that's great and i'm a nerd and i love that kind of stuff but for normal people none of that makes any sense 
none of it. They'll the experience that people want to know about is the user facing experience, and that what make it, that's what makes a distro like Bluefin impressive, and what makes it good to use. The user facing stuff, not the stuff that works in the background to build the images themselves. Most normal people want nothing to do with any of that stuff, and wouldn't understand if you tried to explain it to them. Uh, it's the traditional Linux problem of having nerdy developers attempting to explain the Linux experience to someone who has never had the interest in Linux before. It just doesn't work. It's too nerdy. And the sad thing is Bluefin is awesome for noobs. Like It may be the best new Linux user distro I've ever tried. Uh, without the need to tinker, you can really make Linux into a tool instead of the hobby so many people think that it is. Automatic updates, easy rollback to something easy earlier if things do go wrong, easy access to loads of software without needing to deal with repositories and drivers and such, all make it a great operating system. But the marketing and explanation of what the operating system is falls short and muddles the experience. If you ignore that, it's fine, but it's hard to ignore. The documentation, for example, which the devs have obviously spent a lot of time on and worked very hard on, is technical and nerdy and not at all something you'd point your mother to. And while I've had a great time discussing this distro with developers, the Discord, where you'll go if you have an issue, is full of Linux nerds who answer questions from noobs like all Linux nerds do, technically and with loads of assumptions. So the issue is twofold. First, the developers have managed to create a great operating system for normies, but haven't done a truly great job of explaining why it's great for them. Second, the support faces the same nerd problem all Linux support faces. It's done by nerds who have mostly forgotten what it means to be a normie. Overall, Bluefin is awesome, amazing even. I have no qualms about installing this for any non-techie person in my family. It may just be, like I said, the best new user distro out there. You can set it up for people who know nothing about maintaining Linux and never have to worry about coming back to it in a few months, you know, having to update a thousand packages using apt or DNF. All that stuff is done for you. Most people shut down their computer every day, so all the updates will actually have taken place. It's just all done in the background. Your maintenance of it is non-existence for other people. And even for the more technical users out there, those of us who have used Linux for a long time, this is a great option. It doesn't change the traditional Linux distro like many feared, at, the, at least from a user standpoint. All the nerd stuff is still here if you want it, but the automation and containerized nature of it makes a distro that just gets the fuck out of the way, something that Linux has desperately needed for a long time. So there's actually a chance that after my open SUSE challenge ends, that something like Bluefin will be where I end up. I loved the automation and the invisibility operating system much more than I thought I would at the beginning. I liked that I didn't have to worry about anything regarding maintenance or things like that. I just did my work, and that was awesome. If I ever did need to satisfy my inner tinkerer, I could just install Gentoo and DistroBox and have a play. You know, after that, I would just go back to doing work. I'd, you know, spend my time on YouTube not doing work. I could do my writing. I edit my videos. I just did the work. I never had to worry about the operating system at all, which was awesome. And that makes me want to. It kind of makes me want to switch. Uh, now, I'm a Linux nerd. I've admitted that a couple times already in this video, but I went into this review thinking that Bluefin couldn't win me over. Like, all that FUD that I'd heard before about this type of distro influenced me thinking that this distro just wasn't going to be something that I'd enjoy using. After all, it's not a traditional Linux distro. That's what they say. It's not traditional Linux. But it kind of is. It's just a... It's kind of Linux done in the way that it always should have been, out of your way and powerful. And I think I really like it. So there you go. And I think you might actually like it too. So you should give it a try. So that's my long-term review. And first off, let me say, I scripted that thing. I didn't do a good job following the script, but I never do. So there you go. If you enjoyed this type of video, if you like to see my long-term reviews flourish, you can leave a like, you can leave a subscribe, you can do all those YouTube things. I'd really appreciate it if you haven't done those things already. So 
please do them. I'd really appreciate it. You can follow me on Mastodon and Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. If you have any thoughts on this whole thing, you can leave those in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Linuxcast, just like all of these fine people. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon, YouTube, and Kofi. All of you are absolutely amazing absolutely amazing so thank you so very much for your support if you too would like to support me on patreon you can do so patreon.com slash linux cast links for youtube and ko-fi if you want to support me on those platforms will be in the video description below or you can head on over to the shop which is available at shop.thelinuxcast.org there you'll find awesome merchandise and all the proceeds for that merchandise goes directly towards me making more linux content for you guys so thank you so very much for those of you who have done that and if you haven't already go check the stuff out there's a few new things over there that i've created so give those a check out thanks everybody for watching i hope you enjoyed this one i hope you have a wonderful week and weekend or whatever and a happy holiday and all that stuff i'll see you next time